So welcome, and thank you for coming. My name is Bruce Peabody, and I have organized, along with uh, Professor Woolley, Peter Woolley, the director of Public Mind, the Politics on the Public Mind series for this semester. The series is an open seminar to which we invite students, uh, faculty, and other members of the Florham Madison community. And the theme of this semester is, is law and society. That's a pretty capacious topic, kind of all encompassing, or at least it can encompass a ridiculously large amount of material. But the advantage of that is it allows us to bring together a very interesting and wide range of speakers and topics. As my students know, perhaps ad nauseum, the kinds of themes that I emphasize in talking about law and society are really three. First, the idea I have is that law is ubiquitous, right? It's, it's everywhere. Uh, there was a story in the Times this weekend that uh, a number of advertisers, of course, cannot refer to the Super Bowl as the Super Bowl unless they are official sponsors because they would run afoul of trademark law. So everybody engages in this kind of kabuki dance where they talk about the big game. It's just one, perhaps, uh, small, mundane, but many million dollar uh, legal question that is, uh, that is the heart of this law and society connection. So the second point that I, I think is worth uh, keeping in mind about law and society is that uh, law is important. We'll see that uh, in, in Professor Rosen's discussion from today and, and time and time again in our series this semester. And finally, the last broad theme of the law and society connection for this semester is that these two ideas, uh, law and our social order, are mutually dependent and mutually informing and in that we can't really understand law and our legal enterprise without understanding the society that surrounds and forms uh, and is sometimes limited and limits uh, that, that law. So that's a third theme that we will explore throughout the semester. I hope you'll come not only to today's talk but uh, to our talks every Monday that are going to be taking place as part of this series. Our speakers in this series will reflect these basic themes in a number of different ways. They, are, they come from a variety of different backgrounds. We have lawyers who will, who will be speaking. David Rosen is a lawyer as well as a professor. We have judges who will be coming in and talking about their work, policymakers, uh, journalists, uh, individuals who regularly appear before uh, court TV and other media forums. And substantively, we'll be traveling a wide, uh, we'll be traveling to a wide array of places from the Sierra Leone uh, Truth and Reconciliation Commission today to the New Jersey Supreme Court to a polluted Houston crime laboratory. Uh, we'll take a look at uh, how uh, law and media uh, impact one another and cover a wide array, a wide uh, terrain in, in, uh, in, in exploring our theme of, of law and society. The basic format is very similar to, to today. Uh, you can come around 2 o'clock, get something to eat, get a chance to speak to one another and, and talk to our, our presenters for each week. At 2.30 or a little bit before, we'll begin our presentation. And uh, in future weeks, we won't be so long-winded. That is to say, I won't be so long-winded. Then around, uh, we'll have some Q&A, questions and answers, a chance for all of you to ask questions of our speakers. And around 325, a number of our students will have to leave to go to their other classes. You are welcome to remain behind and still, uh, still ask some questions of our speakers and still get a chance to talk about the themes, topics. But if you are concerned why there's a big rumbling around 325, you will know why that is the case. So I have, in addition to the pleasure of telling you about the, the series generally, which again will run every Monday from now until the 19th of April, with the exception of March 15th, which is when we have our spring break. In addition to letting you know about that, I have the pleasure of getting to let you uh, know a little, bit about, a little bit about Professor Rosen. And the way I think of this is I think back to my college experiences, and, and in my experience, college is a place where there are many reasonably stupid conversations. And by reasonably stupid conversations, I mean conversations for which the, the, uh, the topic may not always be that uh, uh, worthy of discussion, but for which a lot of intellectual firepower is, uh, is trained, or at least energy. When I, was, when I was a student, one of those conversations was about who would you save? Who would you uh, identify as somebody worth saving in the face of a kind of cataclysm? Uh, who would the secret government agents identify if they were constructing a new Eden? And we have our own theories and arguments about who this would be. And I offer to you, 
that such a person might be somebody who's consistently interesting and who makes the world around him more interesting. And I think such a person is David Rosen. Uh, David is uh, somebody who uh, is constantly pulling the, the scales from our eyes when it comes to pointing out injustices in the world. And you'll see some of that today. He's somebody who takes a fresh look at the so-called conventional wisdom and suggests that it is anything but uh, wise, even if it is commonplace. David constantly scrutinizes and appraises the world around us and offers his unique, keen-eyed wisdom and humanity. He is a professor of anthropology and sociology here at Fairleigh Dickinson. He's also a practicing lawyer. He is the author of Armies of the Young, Child Soldiers in War and Terrorism, a book that is obviously relevant to, to today's topic. And he has just signed uh, two additional book contracts that relate to some of the themes of today's talk. He is the winner of the 2008 Distinguished Faculty Award for Research and Scholarship, and he previously received uh, a similar award for his service work. I am delighted to call David a friend and a colleague, and I'm also very pleased that he is kicking us off and kicking off our series on politics on the public mind. Please join me in welcoming David Rosen. Well, I, I'll thank you very much, and I hope this is not going to be one of those boring uh, <laughs> intellectual exercises, but uh, we'll see. I'll leave it to you guys to judge. So today I'm going to be talking about the topic of uh, child soldiers. My, my idea is to try to break the, the talk up into two parts. One is uh, somewhat of a more historical philosophical side of things, and the other is a more technical side uh, dealing with uh, the sort of specific legal issues relating to child soldiers. Um, I hope the slides can be seen. Now, they're, they're, some of them are actually pretty interesting, so I'm sort of hopeful I, I, whether, I don't know about these lights, but I'm hope, hoping that, that some of the slides can be seen. So I'd like to kick it off at least in, the, in this way. My sense is that the whole story of child soldiers can be, understand, can be understood as in, in the story of two different boys born 213 years apart. Um, the first one in 1767, and the second one in 1980. Both boys were 13 years old when they became soldiers. Both fought in brutal partisan conflicts which pitted neighbors against neighbors, um, and in which soldiers and civilians were massacred, murdered, and mutilated. Both became orphans during the war. Both survived and continued their studies after the war. One studied law and was admitted to the bar in North Carolina. The other study took a degree in politics at Oberlin College in Ohio. Both were the subjects of very successful books, national bestsellers indeed. But one was feted as a great American hero while the other became renowned as an international victim of war. 213 years separate the birth of Andrew Jackson, child soldier, hero of the American Revolution, seventh president of the United States, and Ishmael Bia, child soldier, victim of the Civil War in Sierra Leone, and spokesman for the plight of child soldiers everywhere. This is, the, this is the incident in the life, this is, an, this is an incident in the life of Andrew Jackson, um, a child soldier, joined the, joined the Continental Army at age 13, was taken prisoner by the British, and also he fought in North Carolina, which, North, North and South Carolina, which was a brutal conflict. And in his, auto, and in his biography and autobiography of, of Jackson, he talks about the many, many massacres of civilians and soldiers, the mutilization of, mut the, the brutalization, the mutilation of bodies that went on during that period of time. This particular episode turns on a time in which he was captured and refused to polish the boots of a British officer. And the British officer took his sword and hit him with the, with the back side of the sword, mutilating his arm, a problem that he had for the rest of his life. In exactly the same incident, his brother, 
was killed. His brother was murdered by the same, by the same officer. So my point about Jackson is that there's a long history of warfare in which children were involved. But we've conceived of that warfare in a funny way. Um, we conceive today that somehow children are terrible victims of war, and yet a long time ago, we regarded them largely as patriots and heroes. And I want to try to talk a little bit about how and why that may actually have happened. Jack Jackson took his experience as a child soldier, and in 1824, John Eaton wrote his biography of Jackson and turned it into the first presidential campaign biography ever written. And there has been every, every single presidential campaign biography ever written since then has been modeled on this book. And the episode of Jackson as child soldier was central. It was the first real big story of this book. And in his campaign, the actual presidential campaign, you can see this is a poster from the presidential campaign, Jackson parlayed his experience as a child soldier in the Revolutionary War, and of course as a larger hero to some degree in the War of 1812, and parlayed that into the central focus of his presidential campaign. Not, not so unusual, right? So we could probably take John McCain's presidential campaign and, and uh, find it modeled very, very much on this one. On the other hand, Ishmael Bia became widely known in the United States. He's a very, very charming young man, was a child soldier in, the Sierra, Leone, in, in Sierra Leone during the Sierra Leone Civil War, wrote a book which was distributed through Starbucks, probably the best known book on child soldiers in the United States, perhaps the best known book on child soldiers in, th throughout, throughout the world. But his story is very, very different. It's not the story of a hero. It's a story of a victim of war. A lot of this turns on the issue of who is a child, a very, 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 very important issue, which we'll get back to legally. But the whole idea of when childhood, when childhood begins and ends, who is a child? And the other question that is really important here is the question of even if you are a child, is childhood and military service, are they incompatible issues? For a long time, we answered that question, no. We thought for a long time that childhood and military service was compatible. Nowadays, as a general rule, we tend not to think of childhood and military service as, as compatible with one another, but we still have some lingering vestiges of the days in which we did, such as in various kinds of military academies that you sometimes see in advertisements. I always see them in advertisements in the back of the New York Times magazine, but uh, sometimes we think of them as military academies of very bad boys, but, the, uh, but on the whole we still have this, this, this notion that, um, a, a leftover notion of, the, uh, of, of, of the, the benefits of military discipline for young children. Also, so we have, my basic model here is that basically we have a changing paradigm a very, very powerful changing paradigm in which a long, long time ago, and actually not, because like in the 17th, 18th, 19th centuries, and even early into the 20th centuries, child soldiers, when they served, were largely regarded as patriots and heroes, and when they died, they were largely regarded as martyrs. While today, at the end of the 20th, 20th century and the beginning of the 21st century, it's almost impossible to talk about child soldiers in this way. So what I wanted to do is talk a little bit about the historic and ethnographic evidence about this, that is how, it, how I reached this conclusion. I wanted to talk a little bit about the current humanitarian position on this issue, which is a, is a very, very powerful influence on modern day thinking about this. That is to say, today, throughout the world, most humanitarian organizations which are addressing themselves with this issue, and here I would include some of the mo most important groups in, in the Coalition to Stop the Use of Child Soldiers, which would include groups like Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International and Doctors Without Borders, a whole variety of important and powerful humanitarian and human rights groups are trying very, very hard to define child soldiers as any person or a child soldier as any person 
between the age of 0 and 18 to draw what's generally called the straight 18 position, to draw a pretty hard line at, uh, at that age. That, that position, this humanitarian position, as we'll see, has not exactly been clearly translated into international law. For example, so today the International Criminal Court and the Special Court for Sierra Leone, both, of, both important judicial forums which have tried issues relating to child soldiers, um, have largely, through their statutory frameworks, determined the age to be at uh, 15, uh, the age of prohibited recruitment. But we can see there's a tension between humanitarian efforts and uh, to define childhood and the particular legal solutions which have evolved at this point. Um, that is the, the changing and evolving legal order. Uh, most powerfully has been that since um, the uh, writing of the statute of the Special Court for Sierra Leone and the creation of what's called the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court, the recruitment of child soldiers, and by that I mean anybody age 15 and below, um, has been criminalized. It is now an international war crime to recruit any person um, below age 15 as a child soldier, and pressures are, have mounted to try to increase this age to age 18 as well, which we'll see. So what accounts for this? Well, I have a lot of different theories about, I, I have a, a very good sense of what things used to be like, and a very good sense of what things are like today. And I know they're very different from one another. I think of themselves as, as bookends. But the big question is, what happened in between? You know, how did we get from the child soldier as patriot and hero and martyr when they died to the child soldier as victim? What, act, what were the mechanisms? What were the historical, social, cultural mechanisms which brought this about? Part of it, I think, is um, the globalization of the Western concepts of childhood. That is to say, in the West, uh, over the last 150 or 200 years, We've developed a very, very broad sense of childhood as, as being a time of innocence. It's not the only concept of childhood that exists in the West. There, in fact, are competing notions of childhood in the West. But one of the most powerful concepts of childhood in the West is the sense of the innocence and vulnerability of children and their need to, their, their need to grow and to develop in a, kind of, in, a, in, a, in a supportive and nurturing environment. And that's, that, that globalization of that concept, that movement of that concept outside of the West um, to, elsewhere in, else to, to elsewhere in the world has played an important role in our legal thinking about child soldiers. Um, the second, I think, is the simultaneous deromanticization de of war and the romanticization of childhood that I just talked about. And that is to say, if one thinks about how war was talked about, in the 17th, 18th, and 19th century, it's very different from the way in which war is talked about today. Just to some concrete examples, you can't find statues being built to generals and colonels and anybody like that today. There's, there, there, there's, there, there is no longer much of an emphasis in public life on the sort of heroic aspects of war. When people talk about war, they may talk about its necessity, they may talk about the actual hero heroism of common soldiers, but war is no longer associated with the idea of personal glory in any sense whatsoever, although that element still does remain amongst, amongst soldiers in the, in, the, in, in, in the United States as well. But all of our statues, all of our monuments are to the suffering of civilians, all of our statues and monuments are to, are to the, the efforts of the common soldier, not too many generals, not too, not, too, not too many important people. And so this sense has been, a, and also the other thing that's, that's, that's helped to contribute to the de-romanticization of war has actually been photography. That's another area where it's really had, had a powerful influence. And that is to say, let's say the pictures of Matthew Brady, the famous Civil War uh, photographer in the middle of the 19th century brought home to the American people the sort of horrors of warfare in the way that oil paintings of battles never did. 
There are some exceptions to this. There's a Goya's paintings of the Spanish, of, uh, of, of wars in Spain, which have been pretty horrible. Most paintings about war have really glorified war, while the photography of war has worked in exactly the opposite direction. Also, another factor is the inter our international efforts to criminalize war. And that is to say, in general, in the 18th and 19th, and even during early part of the 20th century, war was seen very, very much as, uh, as, as a legitimate part of politics. And increasingly so, especially ever since the founding of the United Nations, war has been seen, lar itself has largely been seen as aberrant, and no, long, no longer a, le a legitimate extension of politics, except in the most extreme kinds of circumstances. Also, Western ideas about war is that warfare outside the West is especially barbaric, savage, and without meaning. And this has a long, long history in the way in which we look at the wars of others, especially, let's say, let's say outside the West. Uh, and it goes back to Joseph Conrad's descriptions of Africa and the various British colonial uh, descriptions of warfare in the 19th century. In fact, it's almost impossible to figure out the difference between the way in which colonialists in the 19th century described African warfare from the way in which humanitarian groups describe the same thing today. There's been a long sense in which, while we may excuse Western wars as being noble and of purpose, that wars outside the West have largely been, rega been regarded as ignoble and barbaric. Um, there's also, I think, uh, another change which has pretty, been pretty important is the professionalization and privatization of Western armies and the narrowing of the concept of the citizen soldier. And I think this plays a pretty important role in immunizing a large majority of people from direct knowledge about the war. In the United States, we have a largely volunteer army. Uh, Great Britain, for many ways, was in the 19th century, was a largely volunteer army. Uh, some moments of recruitment uh, later, later on. Um, increasing sense that we will always have a volunteer army as opposed to drawing upon citizens of all ages and classes and being part of the army. Um, and finally, I think there is also a tendency throughout the world, not, it's not, not a total tendency, to define rebellion and insurgency as criminal. The United States uh, were a country which was founded on revolution and rebellion. And there are many, many revolutions and rebellions going on throughout the world today. But we tend to see these revolutions and rebellions largely through a criminal eye. Now, that's not always the case. In, in the 1960s, um, in the 1950s and the 1960s, during the era of, of decolonization and national liberation, most rebellions and, and insurgencies, while they might have been thought of as criminal by the colonizing power, were in the, wild, were in the world community usually regarded as forms of, forms of national liberation, as natural, national liberation struggles. Today, we no longer see rebellions and insurgency in that, way, in, in that way anymore. So there's been a real sea change and shift on how we look at those kinds of issues. And even popular literature our image of the child soldier has changed dramatically. This is Johnny Tremaine, America's most famous child soldier, I suppose, in, the, uh, in popular literature. When I was a kid growing up, and it became a Walt Disney movie, and if anyone remembers the book, uh, I'm sure that the, that, 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 that the students here don't remember this book, because it's not really read here anymore in, in, in the Northeast. As it turns out, it's, read, it's still quite well read. It's still, it's still read in schools in the South. But it's not, it's not, not read anymore here in, in, in the Northeast. But basically, it's a coming of age story about an American child soldier. Johnny Tremaine is 14 and 15 and 16 as he joins the army as the American Revolution. And his maturity and psychological development and becoming a man is seen very, very much part of his leaving behind his childhood and taking up arms on behalf of the revolution. Instead, Johnny Tremaine has actually been transformed in modern day popular literature into Johnny Mad Dog. And Johnny Mad Dog is the more modern Johnny, not the old Johnny, the new Johnny in this way. And Johnny Mad Dog, this sort of wonderful novel by Emmanuel Nangella, um, talks about um, a different kind of Johnny uh, who's, uh, one could hardly say he reaches uh, 
his, uh, development, his psychological development is dependent upon his participation in war, quite the opposite. His very, his very involvement in war has become uh, degrading both to himself and to his whole society. And that's the more typical Johnny that we would see today in, uh, in, in, popular, novels about, in popular novels about war. Also, we have a long history of children's involvement in war. Um, this is my favorite painting all the time. It's all pretty hard to see in the back, I'm sure. But this is Delacroix's painting, Liberty Leading the People. And although most people focus on Liberty, was the, she was the model for the Statue of Liberty um, in the, of, the, of the United States, most people focus on Liberty. Um, in fact, it's very, it's very, very simple to see that right next to Liberty, there was a young boy, and that young boy had uh, two pistols. And this really represents Delacroix's painting of uh, the July Revolution in 1830 in France and the kind of people that were on the barricades. This became actually later on memorialized in Victor Hugo's uh, book, uh, Les Miserables, and the young, uh, the young boy became the model for uh, Gavroche, one of, the sort of, one of the heroes in, uh, in Les Miserables. But what Delacroix was, Delacroix was pointing to in this painting was the very, very widespread presence of children in France, in, re in revolutionary France. And he was not the only painter to take note of that. Here is uh, Philippe Auguste uh, Genron's painting of the Little Patriots, also referring back to the July, back to the July Revolution of young children involved in, uh, in, in war. And, oh, okay. This is, this is, these, these are really the, the, the French experience in revolutionary France. And uh, it's not that they were, actually I should say that it wasn't as if there were not some dissenters in France about their involvement of children. That even at that time, the famous uh, French writer Chateaubriand uh, was a dissenter about the role of children in, uh, in war. But for the most part, in thinking about the French Revolution and the role of children, their, their, their role has largely been painted as heroic. Uh, if you look at the memoirs of Chateaubriand, you'll take a, um, a you see, see somewhat of a dissenting view, but it's always interesting to know that those memoirs and those portions of the memoirs are really not available in English. So it's actually somewhat, somewhat, somewhat hard to find. This is actually my favorite child soldier. This is uh, Clarence McKenzie. And, uh, and the reason that he's my favorite child soldier is because uh, he's buried not too far from my house. See, so uh, he's, uh, Clarence McKenzie was, um, I live, I actually, although I teach here, I have to confess, I actually live in Brooklyn. And, um, and uh, in Brooklyn, there's a very wonderful old cemetery called Greenwood Cemetery which was founded, I think, in 1838 or 1848. I forget exactly the date. It's now a National Historic uh, Monument. And Clarence McKenzie um, was one of the first soldiers in the United States to die in the Civil War. Now, Clarence, he's the, I, I, I shouldn't say he was exactly the first. So, so, you know, this is a, not exactly a, a race to the finish here, but uh, there was someone else who died before him, I think, in, in the, in, in the, pro, the pro-slavery riots in Maryland. There was a 17-year-old soldier from Massachusetts who died a couple of months before Clarence McKenzie. But Clarence McKenzie died, um, was the first soldier in New York, in, in, especially in Kings County, where I live in Brooklyn, to die in the American Civil War. And here's his monument in, uh, he was a drummer boy. Here's his monument in Greenwood Cemetery. It's quite a, it's sort of hard to see in this picture, but it's quite a wonderful, it's quite a wonderful monument to him, which was uh, put up a number of years after he died. And uh, it's hard to see, so I'll read this out to you, which says here, um, um, Clarence McKenzie um, says the drum and bugle corps were the first Regiment of the New York State Militia in memory of Clarence McKenzie, born February 8, 1849, died at Annapolis June 11, 1861, aged 12 years, 4 months, and 3 days. So Clarence McKenzie was um, 
the first, the first soldier in Brooklyn, at least, to die, to die. He actually he died in a shooting accident. He died in a shooting accident in Annapolis. He was actually, sadly, he was actually shot by a, a fellow soldier. And uh, after that, his body was packed in ice, and he was brought back to New York, where there was a major church service for him. And of course, it was very, very early in the war, so 3,000 people attended this, memor this, this memorial and funeral to Clarence McKenzie. And if you read through the various funeral sermons and others, they were extraordinarily patriotic sermons, basically calling upon Clarence McKenzie as the hero of the war, hero of the war, calling upon the mourners in the north to drive the traitors and the conspirators down into the Gulf of Mexico. Fairly strident and patriotic language built around the martyrdom of this child, of this of this young this young boy. But nothing about him as being a victim. <laughs> I mean, there's no sense of him as being a victim other than being a victim of of the South, of being a victim of the rebellion, of being very, very much uh, a first soldier. And, and his, in the back of his memorial, it says, so I know it's hard to see, it says the first, it says the first offering of King's County in the War of the Rebellion. The first offering of King's County in the War of the Rebellion. Very much the kind of, and later on he became, he became called the boy martyr. Very, very much in the language of offering courage, martyrdom, in the suppression, in the suppression of the rebellion. Boy soldiers were everywhere. Clarence, Clarence McKenzie died as a, as a drummer boy in, uh, in the June of 1861, just six weeks before the Battle of Bull Run. But just a few weeks later, there was a second funeral in Brooklyn, and that was the result of the Battle of Bull Run, and that was a soldier by the name of Joseph Darrow. He was not, a, he was not like, Clarence, like Clarence McKenzie, a drummer boy. He was an actually on-the-line soldier, age, age 15, who was killed in the Battle of Bull Run, and he was buried, he still is buried, actually, in Shaco Cemetery in, uh, in, Rich, in Richmond, Virginia, at the time, and also in a service which was reminiscent of the same kind of ser same kind of service that that, uh, that 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 celebrated the death of, uh, of Clarence McKenzie, he was also celebrated as a as a patriot and a hero and a martyr to um, to the Union cause and the abolition of slavery. So for a long time throughout the 19th century, where we had the deaths of soldiers, child soldiers, and there were there were many. It's actually sort of fairly hard to estimate exactly how many. This is actually part of my own project, exactly how many young soldiers were killed and actually how many young soldiers served. Some estimates were that they were one or two percent of the actual number of armies, but um, it's not clear what, what those estimates were based on. I've been sort of counting tombstones in the Greenwood Cemetery and, uh, and the sort of very, very large numbers of under 15-year-olds who served in all different kinds of capacities in the Civil War and trying to get some sort of better sense of what the actual... And, and one a colleague of mine who's trying to do the same thing for the Revolutionary War has been counting pension records of Revolutionary War soldiers to try to get also a better handle on the numbers of young, the numbers of youngsters. But whatever one can say is they weren't an aberration. In other words, in the modern day humanitarian language, it's very much talked about as if the child soldier phenomenon was a modern phenomenon. That somehow something new and horrible has come in this world and the like. And all of a sudden, all of a sudden children are on the front line and children are, are, are in wars. And I think my research and the research, research of others has come to show that that's simply not true. What's happened, I mean, I'm not saying it's, uh, I mean, one thing is it might be to say that, that we think about child soldiers very differently today than we think about, than we thought about them in the past, and that is certainly true. And also there's probably one might say that the actual nature of warfare and, and may, may also have changed in some way, although it's somewhat a, de somewhat a matter of degree and kind, to some degree, we have sanitized warfare in the past, especially in, in, in our own history. When we think about, I was very struck by, by the accounts of warfare in North and, North and South Carolina, in which 
Um, the Revolutionary War was very, very much a civil war in North and South Carolina, and very, very much pitting uh, you know, neighbors and friends against one another in a very, very brutal way, which is uh, sort of reminiscent of many wars that we see today in, uh, out, outside the United States. I'm going to skip these. This is a, a kid like this was called a powder monkey. And uh, this is his, his, na his name is Augustine Fuller, actually. And, uh, and he was a powder monkey on the US. US ships were filled with powder monkeys. That is to say, all naval vessels were filled with them because they had thin hands and they could help pack cannons and they brought, they brought, I mean, they helped bring ammunition and powder from the powder holes to the, to the guns. So that naval vessels of war in the United States and Great Britain were filled with children. And also partly it was the fact that being a child was um, mil military, be becoming trained in the military was very, very much until the creation of the great academies, and even big past those, was very much a system of apprenticeship. And like the people, kids learned on the job, whether or not they were powder monkeys like this or midshipmen of various kinds. This is a very, very important part of the, of the training was this sense of being an, being an apprentice. These are, these are a little too hard to see. These are child soldiers of the Confederacy and the Union in the Second World, in the, in the Civil War. So pretty young. John Lincoln Clem was a very, very important child soldier who went on to become a very successful businessman in Ohio. I think he was called the drummer boy of the Cumberland. And uh, he's a, he, he, had been, he had been involved in the army. He, he, he left, I think he, he left the army as a sergeant, a very successful soldier. And, uh, and he uh, changed his name after President Lincoln was assassinated from John Clem to John Lincoln Clem in honor of the assassinated, in honor of the assassinated president. Dead Confederate soldier. This is one of the Matthew Brady, I know it's really hard to see in, the, in this light, but this is one of the, Matthew, the famous Matthew Brady photographs of a 14-year-old um, dead Confederate soldier. It was actually done in, he actually did it in, the sort of, in, that stere, in that stereoscope. We don't use them anymore, right? If people remember that you could slide two photo, two, you could slide a stereoscopic photograph into a, into a machine and look into it with your two eyes, and you would get almost like a 3D, um, a 3D version of the, uh, of the photograph. Uh, these are drummer boys from New York. More drummer boys, filled with drummer boys. David Dodd, age 17, hanged as a spy. This is sort of interesting. Uh, he was a southern spy um, and uh, tried to penetrate through Union lines and failed. They found secret messages in the heel of his shoe. He was tried on the spot and hanged. The interesting thing, uh, aside from the fact that it was a sort of pretty horrible experience, but uh, the interesting thing is how he became an icon for the Southern cause, and he was sort of this black-haired kid. But the way he ended up in, a, uh, in, in the, in the, in the um, painted glass um, portrait of him in the church in Arkansas, which now sits in the Confederate Museum in Richmond, was as this blonde-haired icon of, uh, Confederate, uh, white, uh, of the Confederate white South. Um, this is uh, World War I. Um, Victoria Cross winner, uh, also 16 years old, uh, Thomas Rickett. And this was, a, and this was in, the, in World War I, there were probably, it's estimated there probably were hundreds of thousands of child soldiers on the British side. And this was a very satirical, uh, a very satirical cartoon in Punch magazine in 1915 because even in 1915, the, in which Great Britain, it was largely still a volunteer army in Great Britain, but there were, in theory, various age limits on recruitment. Uh, Punch magazine is uh, commenting on the, on the status of what was really going on. And there's a boy in front of a recruiting officer, and the officer, to a boy of 13, in his effort to get taken in as a bugler, um, has given, and has given his age as 16, the officer says to him, do you know where boys go who tell lies? And the boy proudly says, yes, sir, to the front. And, um, and this tells you exactly what, what the situation really was in Great Britain in, uh, in, in 1815. 
And, um, and actually, the huge, huge numbers of child soldiers in Great Britain in the First World War, and interestingly enough, in the Second, in the second World War as, uh, as well. So, um, yes, this is, this is sort of my famous, my favorite, um, uh, um, John Drack Travers. I have to sort of actually go and read a piece of this to you, because it's a... Uh, he was an interesting because he was killed. He was a, a Boy Scout originally, who was killed in the ba he was killed in the Battle of Jutland, one of the sort of earliest um, naval engagements in the in the in the First World War, and uh, he became a his body was brought back to London. He was buried in a huge cemetery. Sorry, in a huge in a huge ceremony. Not unreminiscent of, this, of the same kind of ceremony that, a comfort, that accompanied Clarence McKenzie. There were thousands of people came to this. The Army, the Navy, the Boy Scouts, the Girl Scouts. Uh, children raised money for his uh, memorial. And uh, child welfare advocates came and talked about the powerful contribution that he had made, the powerful patriotic contribution he had made. And uh, he, they said, you know, as long as people of noble virtue shall continue to live in Britain, no one will ever forget the name of John Travers. Uh, he actually had two, he had, he had two different names. Um, anyway, so uh, last summer I was giving a talk in, uh, in, in, uh, in uh, Sheffield in the UK, and I, I said, uh, anybody here remember John Travers? You know, I was like, so, can you remember him? Uh, not a single person remembered him. So I, so I said, well, it just goes to show you that, uh, that his, name, his name didn't live forever. And, uh, and certainly the noble virtues which were, being, uh, which were being attributed to him and which they said would never, and, and, and which the speaker said at that time, would, li would last into time immemorial, the brave boy, soldier, and sailor have faded from the scene completely. James Bud Bissett, age 14, child soldier, Durham, Alec Campbell, another World War I child soldier. And this is, this is a recent, this is Jack Lucas. This is, this is just an obit from uh, just a couple of years ago in the New York Times of this, uh, one of the youngest Congressional Medal of Honor winner in World War II was also a child soldier, you know, made many, many, many successful attempts to, to enlist and finally, and finally snuck himself into the, uh, into the, into the army and became an important uh, medal winner and later on, when he recently died, became an important spokesman for, uh, for the military and the rest of his life. Uh, Russian general, child soldier almost, anti-fascist group. This, is, this I got from the Steven Spielberg, Spielberg film archives and uh, it's, it's an anti-fascist group in Yugoslavia and was, uh, you could sort of see, this is in the Second World War, filled with men, women, and children. Polish partisans, all children, Second World War. Ukrainian partisan, 15 years old, Second World War. This is uh, a woman named, a young girl, really, 16, Masha Bruschka. And uh, she was also a anti-German partisan in the Second World War. And she's on her way to being executed. And the, um, because the Germans basically executed every partisan. It was this, this, this is just a simple way of doing things. They didn't really care much about age. And she says, she has a sign on her, she has a sign that she's wearing on her way to execution, which says, Wir sind Partisanen und haben auf deutsche Soldaten geschossen which basically means we are partisans and we shot at German soldiers. As it turns out, she didn't really shoot at German soldiers. This was the standard sign that they made them wear on their way to their, uh, to their executions and the like. She was actually a saboteur in this particular case. And here she's hanged. This is a, a recent shot in Poland. I mean, some of you here probably heard of the sort of Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, which was the sort of famous uprising of Jews against the Nazis in the Second World War in 1943. Um, and of course, that was uh, terribly, uh, you know, put down. And of course, huge numbers of the, of the partisans that were involved in that struggle came out of the various socialist and Zionist um, youth movements that existed in the ghetto at the time. And almost all of them were 
well, almost all of them were very, very young, age, uh, you know, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. It's hard to imagine how, how youthful and young the resistors in the Warsaw Ghetto uprising really were. It's kind of, it's, it's, it's actually mind-boggling to go think about uh, um, how really it was very, very much the young children that really were involved in the anti-Nazi struggle. Um, this actual ceremony, which took place in Warsaw about four years ago, is really of a different uprising, which was called the Warsaw Uprising, which took place in 1944 when the Polish people thought that the Nazis had almost been defeated. It turns out they were really wrong. The Warsaw, the Warsaw Uprising was also put down, but it was largely a Polish uprising as opposed to a Polish-Jewish uprising at this particular point. But the statue here is to, it's called, it's called the Monument to the Little Partisan because it focuses on the very, very large numbers of Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts and others who really played a very, very powerful role as child soldiers and partisans in that war. And of course, here we have some standard photos. This is the so-called Small Boys Unit in Sierra Leone. That's a photo which probably was posed. Um, uh, child soldiers in Liberia. And here's an example. This is, this is sort of maybe part of the, I'm not sure how, I'm not sure how to talk about this photo. It's, it may be part of the propaganda war between Israelis and Palestinians. It's really, it's, uh, it's hard to know. This was a, a photograph uh, widely, widely distributed a, a few years ago about a young Palestinian child dressed as a suicide bomber and was found apparently in someone's house and the like. Um, for a while it had a lot of play, you know, in terms of the, in Israel and, uh, and Palestine, in terms of the recruitment of children into uh, Islamic Jihad and the others and the celebration of, uh, of such children. It's still not clear what to make of this, exactly what to make of this photograph. Okay, so that's the history side <laughs> of, the, of the talk in a sense to try to bring you, bring you up to date, and I suppose I would say the, the main two points that I, that I hope to convey, okay, the main two points I hope to convey, I should say. How much time do I have? 30 seconds. 30 seconds, should I wrap up? Okay. The main two points really have to do with the, with the fact that child soldiers have been around, around with us for a long, long time, and, but we've come to think about them very, very differently today. Now we have, since um, our legal system, however, has adopted, has adapted fa fairly slowly to the, issue, to the issue of child soldiers. In the Geneva, Con the first real attempt to codify the laws of war, the Geneva Conventions, really didn't address itself at all. This was the 1949 Geneva Conventions, the one that people refer to all the time, really don't mention child soldiers at all. There's no real mentioning of it. From 1949 until 1977, there was virtual silence on the issue. But the interesting thing is, is that in 1977, there was an attempt at adding uh, amendments, which were called protocols, to the Geneva Conventions. And these were called Geneva Additional Protocols 1 and 2. This is the legal side. I'm sure you'll find it to be... Uh, um, and what the Geneva Protocol did was to define, was to try to come out and try to prohibit the recruitment of children. And remember, this is, this is 1977, so it's a period of time in which virtually all the wars of national liberation, which had taken place from the end of World War II until the liberation of all the sort of old traditional French, Eng French English, Dutch, colonies of the world, and all these nations have come into independence now, and it's important to remember that all these, na all these national liberation movements had large numbers of child soldiers in them. In 1977, when that period came to an end, there came to be a move to prohibit child soldiers. And the first effort really was in the, in the, in the Geneva Additional Protocols, and began to restrict the recruitment of children under age 15. And, and the language was slightly cagey in some ways, you might say. It asked, and, and it wasn't very strong, it asked armies to refrain from recruiting. It didn't say stop recruiting, it said refrain from recruiting, which is quite a different thing. The language was really quite weak. 
and that it said they should take all feasible measures against direct participation in hostilities. And that is to say, the idea really was to try to, it was really largely the language of persuasion, I might say, because the, none of these treaties, until the creation of the International Criminal Court uh, in The Hague and, uh, and, and the Special Court of Sierra Leone, there were no penalties associated with violators of these rules. In other words, these were treaties, nations signed up for them, they agreed to them, but they were not self, they were not self enforcing. They were only enforced through some mechanisms which might say are, which are generally called naming and shaming. That is in a sense to try to name the violators and hopefully shame them into compliance and the like. So this is the way it stood with the Geneva, with the Geneva Additional Protocols 1. And, and Geneva Additional Protocols 1 really focused mainly on state armies. They said, all you state armies out there who recruit child soldiers, this is what you got to do. And you can see it was sort of fairly toothless. It was an attempt to try to create a kind of an international standard. And if you were going to recruit, then they ended up saying, and if you were going to recruit child soldiers despite this, try to recruit the older ones first. That was the, uh, the idea. There was also a Geneva Additional Protocol too, which was actually aimed at rebel groups. This was really pretty interesting because rebel groups don't get to participate in the discussion. I mean, only states get to participate in the discussion. So rebel groups get to, they, they're at the receiving end of the law, but they're not at the creating end of the law. And the, and the rebel groups, they, they were a little harder on the rebel groups. They said, shall not be recruited into the armed forces or groups, nor be allowed to take part in hostilities. Yeah. Can we just take a quick break, get a couple student questions before they need to... Sure. To, to, uh, it seems like even though the Geneva Convention and a lot of international laws are against child soldiers, it doesn't seem like anything's really going to be done about it until international organizations are given some teeth. I mean, you can pass as many protocols as you want until the criminal courts are able to really prosecute people who do this, except in select cases like they do now, nothing's really going to be done about that. Do you think well, there are, there they can are, be improved? There are criminal prosecutions that have taken place. They're, they're virtually all the leaders of all the different factions in the war in Sierra Leone were prosecuted in the special court for Sierra Leone, and virtually every single one of them was found uh, guilty for the recruitment of child soldiers. Now, on the other side, one might say, it's true that they were found guilty of recruiting child soldiers, but also they were found guilty of many, many other atrocities. I mean, it wasn't just the recruiting of child soldiers that was involved, it was murder and rape and many, many horrible kinds of crimes. So that there was, uh, in that sense, there was a, a fair amount of teeth built into the, into the special court statute in getting at least the leadership of the, of the, of the various factions. And I, I mean, I, I think you can, you can agree or disagree on this issue, and I think there are many, many points of contention but, of, about this, but it certainly was an effort to do it. The first case in which a person has been tried, or the first case in which they thought a person has been tried solely on the issue of child soldiers is really before the Hague now, and that is uh, Thomas Lubanga Diala. And he was put on trial solely on the issue of trial, child soldiers. So then you would have gotten a good sense of what the weight of the law might have been on that particular issue. And he was the head of a Congolese faction in the, in the great Congolese Civil War. Um, my understanding, of the, the prosecution has now tried to modify the indictment to, uh, to include other things. So the question is, and the court, is, the court now has to try to decide whether it's going to, uh, all testimony has been, done, has been taken against him already. So in theory, the defense, was supposed to be, the defense was supposed to be on on this case. I was sort of following this case sort of fairly carefully. The defense was supposed to be on, but um, now, as, now that since, since the prosecution has to await the court's decision as to whether it can modify its indictment, we don't actually know what's going to happen there. And if it does, from a, from a purely scientific point of view, it has nothing to do with, uh, with, uh, with, uh, with uh, Thomas Lubanga Diala. From a purely research point of view, I, so, I would have rather have seen just the indictment on child soldiers, because then I would have had a better sense of what weight a court would attribute merely to the issue of the recruitment of child soldiers as opposed to all the other kinds of atrocities he may now be charged with. And then it's sort of hard to, it's hard to make sense, uh, hard to make sense of it and the like. But I don't know, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a, fair, it's a fair question as to, as to whether or not 
international tribunals are usually, especially the ad hoc international tri tribunals like the Special Court in Sierra Leone, were very severely underfunded. And, uh, and it means basically that they have to really very much pick and choose the persons who are going to be the persons who are going to be prosecuted. There, the decision was to prosecute the, per the persons who were most responsible for the war, and that's what ended up in that case. There, are other, there were other points of view on this issue. There were there are points of view that wanted a broader mandate in the beginning. There were points of view. The Sierra Leone ambassador to the United Nations. There were points of view in, in that particular instance where they actually wanted children to be tried for war crimes, a very, very hotly contested issue as to whether or not children are responsible for war crimes and whether, you know, because after all, it was widely felt that many, many children in the, in the war in Sierra Leone committed terrible war crimes. Yeah. We'll, we'll take a second Around student that'd be question. Great. Um, on your point, Professor, about prosecution of children who have committed war crimes, is there any current precedent or does the blame solely lie on the person who has recruited them? Let's say, for example, a child soldier has joined up at 15 or 16 and has stayed in until after the magic number of 18 and has committed war crimes. Are they considered responsible or because they were recruited at so young age, they're not held yeah. culpable? Well, right now, there's, right now there's no law. I can tell you what, what, what was tried to be done in the, in the special court for Sierra Leone, which is the first attempt to do that. The, the statute of the special court in Sierra Leone tried to distinguish between children under age 15, children between 15 and 18, and, and anyone above 18. The idea was in this middle category between 15 and 18 that some children might be put on trial because it was widely recognized that some children had committed terrible war crimes, but that they would not be subject to criminal sanctions. That is to say, they would not be imprisoned even if found guilty. As it turned out, that model, which might have been very interesting to follow, never, it actually never happened. In the end, the prosecutor, uh, David Crane, decided that he was not going to be in prosecuting anybody between the ages of 15 and 18, so that we don't really know that you know, children between, any, anyone who was a child soldier in Sierra Leone who was dealt with outside, within the, within the framework of the legal system, and it's not really the legal system was dealt with within the framework of so-called, of the so-called Truth and Reconciliation Commissions, but not within the framework of the, of, of, of the, of the prosecutorial, of the, of the prosecutorial system. So that's what happened, that's what happened there. So right now there's no law, really, about, I mean, in other words, I mean, I would argue, and this is my, as a, as a lawyer, and I just recently wrote a law review article on this whole issue, I mean, I would argue that there probably needs to be something, either an international juvenile component to the ICC or an international juvenile court, but I don't really believe, in my own, from my own point of view, that anybody under 18 is automatically immune from, from being charged with crimes. Uh, merely because of uh, merely because of age. So now, whether they should be handled exactly like adults, I think is I think people can argue. And I, I thought this, I thought the original model of the statute of, of the special court in Sierra Leone was pretty decent. M maybe I wouldn't have agreed with every point, but it was actually fairly good um, in, in many many ways. But it didn't work out. I mean, whatever whatever it is, no children have been prosecuted ever for war crimes at this at this point. Let's take a 60 second break. Those students who have other classes or need to see their military recruiting officer can leave now. And otherwise, uh, you're welcome to stay. If David has a few more minutes to uh, take some more questions, maybe speak a little bit about the legal issues. So, so, so David will say a bit more about the uh, about this legal aspect of the argument, and then we'll maybe another five minutes or so, and then we'll open things up to uh, to Q and A from from those remaining. Okay, I'd just like to talk a little bit about the Convention on the Rights of the Child, which is the most powerful legal instrument, you know, uh, and one of the most powerful instruments in the world now, which is trying to define childhood globally. And the interesting thing about the Convention on the Legal Rights of the Child is that even though it, even though it generally defined, defined childhood as... Uh, sorry, sorry. Even, though it, even though the Convention on the Rights of the Child defined childhood as beginning at zero and ending at age 18, the odd thing about the convention was it carved out an exception for such for child soldiers. For child soldiers, it said 
<laughs> it only prohibited recruitment at age 15. This is an amazing kind of treaty which defines childhood everywhere all over the world as beginning at, as ending at, at as, as from zero to 18 finds this one major exception in, this, in the language of the convention and that is uh, on the issue of child soldiers. But um, I'm going to get to the um, Rome Statute which I think is probably the most uh, important. The Rome Statute and the Statute of the Special Court for Sierra Leone have almost identical language now. And this is the, Ro the Rome Statute is the statute which defines the, the basis of the International Criminal Court in the, United, in, in the Hague. And basically it says um, for, to all states conscripting or enlisting children under the age of 15 years into the national armed forces or using them to participate actively in hostilities um, is prohibited and that's a war crime now. And even for non-state actors, <coughs> that is to say, rebel groups, well, who would be in rebel groups? And you could sort of think of them. They would be like uh, Hezbollah, Islamic Jihad, uh, forces in Afghanistan or Iraq, which make use of child soldiers. They're not, parties to the tr they're not parties to the treaty. That is to say, unlike states, they don't sign the treaties. But the treaty purports to regulate them anyway, and it says, conscripting or enlisting children under the age of 15 into armed forces or groups or using them to participate actively in hostilities um, is uh, also an international war crime in, uh, today. And but I, but I was saying the only person so far <coughs> excuse me, who's now actively on trial on this issue is Thomas Lubanga Diala, although there are others now waiting in the wings to be tried by the International Criminal Court on this particular issue, and some are under indictment, but they have not been arrested. <coughs> so we're really only beginning to see now the prosecutions of recruiters of child soldiers, but I have no doubt that in, um, sorry, that in, that in wars to come, that more and more people will be prosecuted on the, on the issue of the child soldier count. I think the child soldier issue to some extent has been settled. The only outstanding problem of child soldiers, I would say, is, is as follows. That most states, most nation states, don't recruit child soldiers anymore. And therefore, the entire, the one major exception to this is Burma. So outside of Burma, there's very little actual recruitment of child soldiers by nation states. Certainly no child soldiers that would fit under the statute of anyone below age 15. The real problem of child soldiers lies in rebel groups and insurgents. That is to say, whatever you want to call them, rebels, insurgents, terrorists, what have you. Those are the main recruiters of child soldiers. And the problem becomes how can you get compliance in international law with the main recruiters of child soldiers who are really rebel groups and who are regarded as criminals anyway within the societies that within the societies and countries that they're functioning in it only adds a little bit perhaps more of punishment now i know that the united nations has tried to meet with leaders of various rebel groups and say to them things like if you ever are successful and if you ever achieve victory in your country we will have a difficult time recognizing you as a leader if you continue to recruit child soldiers that apparently has had almost no effect on rebel levels of recruitment as you can see uh, one, one might take any rebellion where child soldiers are used fairly widely let's say for example the Maoist rebellion in India where they're wide where they are widely you know widely used and, um, and certainly in, in, uh, in Nepal, where there was a fair amount of widespread recruitment of child soldiers, um, there's no mention of punishment for the recruitment of uh, child soldiers there. So it's not clear where, it's not clear how it is that laws which are created by nation states and which are designed to uh, affect the behavior of rebel groups will have a lot of power in, in altering their course of behavior. Now, of course, sometimes rebels are turned in, like in the case of the Congo. You have Thomas Lubanga Diallo arrested and turned in by his own country to the International Criminal Court in The Hague. But it's not clear what kind of pattern that will, 
whether that will be a consistent pattern. So that's the real problem with trial soldiers today. It's not nation states. It's really these. Re it's really rebel groups. That's uh, the and.